Oh, it's uh, Monday morning. Uh, it's sort of about 10. Two after, that's not too bad. And uh, since it's Monday morning, that can mean many things. But among those things, among those many things is it's time for relaxing painting with Dyson Dungeons. And as we say on our show, and I'm here at the table with me <laughs> and the thing I'm going to paint. So um, in typical Monday morning relaxing painting with Dyson Dungeons fashion, I need to tell you how this goes because it's typical, is um, so I took this figure out. It's a archer fairy, and you might notice that it's not complete. Okay, that is because um, I said, "Well, I'm going to prepare for the show, so I'm going to put it on the sticky tack sand." Okay, you know, hold it there, and I did, and I didn't break it doing that. And then it was, "Oh, the paint I need is over there." Okay, in that pile of paints that has not been put away in weeks and weeks. Okay. So what did I do is I, I reached over, right? And uh, I'm wearing this oversized sweatshirt that says, don't worry, I have a plan with a D20 with a one because, you know, that's how things roll on what, with my character on Dyson Dungeons. So yeah, so I reached over and of course I knocked this over and of course it fell and broke the uh, the bow and the arrow point. Well, one of the reasons I'm a little bit late is because I was I spent some a good amount of time crawling around on the floor. Uh, not that much fun doing that, really. But I did find I found the bow. Okay, and so um, I'm going to use some adhesive of some sort and reattach that. Uh, the arrow point I did not find, right? I'm pretty lucky that I was able to find this because this would have been really hard to fabricate, but I can make a new arrow point out of um, out of a toothpick. So I'm going to be doing that too. Uh, I, was, I wasn't planning to do those things, but then again, I wasn't planning to just do the stuff so typical of the kinds of things that um, I managed to make happen on this stream is, uh, yeah, knock things over and break them. I think, uh, I think it's not not a not a huge proportion of these mini figs, but I would say at least. No, I'm gonna have to be honest. At least 15% of the time. I break them <laughs> and then either have to like fabricate a new sword blade or spend a lot of time digging around on the floor or somewhere else trying to find the part and then getting it back on. <laughs> I have to admit it's uh, it's a fairly common thing. So the the really good thing though is I did find I did find this because that would have, like I said, would have been next to impossible to to recreate. So um, I'm going to uh, stick it back on. The, th the thing that really should be used for that is uh, super glue, a silent acrylic real glue, but I don't have that. Uh, I do, but it's way back in a drawer somewhere and I'd have to be rummaging around trying to find it. And it's probably, you know, like five years old and even though the tube hasn't been opened it's going to be bad so there we go um so i'm going to use this uh, contact cement it uh on these little things like sword blades and arrow points and stuff that i break off fairly consistently um i um i found that this works better than epoxy and can't see up close with my glasses on. Those of you who watch this with any regularity know that. Um, it sometimes leaves a little blob, okay, because of where the cement is, but it has two advantages. 
One is that it grabs. Okay, what I mean by that is that um, I put it on both surfaces, and if I can get it on both surfaces, it adheres to itself, and so the, the parts stick. And that's kind of important because with the epoxy, with something like this holding it in place for the better part of five, more than five minutes, that would be, it's just next to impossible to hold it still enough. And there's no way to fix it otherwise. And, you know, it's kind of weird. You can actually sort of shape this stuff. It's almost plasticine uh -oh, until it grabs. <sighs> yeah, you know, it really helps to like cap it up because it's starting to escape. Um, this, this takes a long, long time to set up. You know, uh, but I mean, it holds right away. It takes a long time before it's hard. I guess I'll put it that way. But it grabs right away like that, see? And it remains flexible. Um, for a while. Position the part. Okay, well, it's not perfectly placed. You no, know, but it's. If this were ever to appear on camera, uh, it's it's adequate. So needless to say, uh, painting the bow is going to be one of the last things I do as I give this as much time as possible to um, harden, to cure. Okay, well, at least I didn't break off the little ear horns. This wing has already been broken off twice. There's, you can see the adhesive back there. Oh, yeah. She's been taking a beating. Okay. I think if it stays there, that's that's pretty good. That'll be as good as it gets. Um, as far as the arrow point goes, actually, this is shaped really quite well. Uh, this. Thank you for the follow, by the way. I really appreciate it. You started following before I even got started. And you get to see a classic, a classic um, episode of the Relaxing Painting stream because breaking things and having to repair them because that seems to be a thing I do. Um, this is round, and so what I need to do is flatten it a little bit, okay, on both sides, and then cut it off and do the same thing. Use, use this um, contact cement to stick the arrow head back on the arrow. And it doesn't need to be very big. It's only going to go back about like that far. Okay. And to do this, I need a needle file, which are over there. I'll be back in a second. yeah I mean I was doing okay I put this thing on on here without breaking it and then um, the problem is that you know if it if this was just standing on its own on the cardboard here it probably wouldn't have been knocked over because I would have been reaching up above it but yeah so now well, let me do this on screen this is really exciting stuff but hey why not? Right, it's supposed to be a stream, so we'll just uh, make everything make everything visible here. It's flat on that side. Wow, this is really soft. Other toothpicks that I use, which are flat toothpicks, not round toothpicks, 
the flat toothpicks um, that I have used many times now to fabricate sword blades, which, you know, get broken off because it's what I do on this stream. Okay. Seems to be made out of harder wood. They, they don't file down quite so fast. Yeah, here, so you can see that it's, uh, you know, getting flatter. And believe it or not, this will probably end up looking okay. Just like the sword blades usually end up looking okay. I've got one here. <laughs> I'm gonna take a chance. This is one, this is a very similar bow. Yeah. So similar that it's exactly the same, really. Um, but I wanna check <coughs> the, the, yeah, the arrowhead is really, really thin. So I'm gonna file this a little bit more. This, it will not get that thin. It just, it just won't, because I think the wood will support it, but I'll make it as thin as I can. So, yeah, relaxing, relaxing, breaking things with Dyson Dungeons. I will eventually get around to painting once I eventually get done putting pieces together again. I would be painting right now, or at least I'd be picking colors out. The recommendation from Nicole, member of Dyson Dungeons, who is an artist, a university trained artist. is to paint this one in octal colors which will be browns and reds mainly i'm i'm going to avoid yellow because the yellows yellow paints just don't cover very well the kind of browns and, and reds and so some of those that maybe even are like brownish red or reddish brown And I'm going to be, at some point, when I'm done making this as thin as I can without having to start over because I messed it up. Hi, who? I will do a flip. You missed, you missed the, uh, you missed the uh, the classic knocking things over and breaking them part of the of the stream. Yep, I knocked this over, broke off the bow, broke off the arrowhead. I'm doing an arrowhead here. Maybe I'll do the flip before I glue this on. Maybe, yeah, I'm going to flip something very small. I don't want to keep knocking this over. I'm going to put it way on a side, way aside. Yeah. So I could do the paint or the little, the little stick with the dot. I'm going to do the, uh, the little stick with the dot today. I lost these on Friday. I was looking for these. These are my, my lightweight flipping things, and I had to do a heavyweight flipping thing on Friday. But fortunately, uh, the thing I was painting I was able to hold up to it. So, But I already broke this once. I broke two things on it with one breakage. Uh, so we'll do this. Yeah. No dot. No dot. No dots went in here. No dot has got three to nothing. <laughs> dot. No, off camera. Off camera doesn't count even when I came up dot. Okay, four to one. <laughs> four to two. You would expect it to be three to three, but that just can't happen every time. You know, each flip is a 50-50 chance. 
And so the previous flip does not influence in any way the probability of what will come up in the next flip. So even though you flip it, I mean, each time you flip it. So the odds of four to two happening, if you just say, what are the odds if I were to start, you know, from, you know with no flips at all, and then did a flip or two, you no, know, and then I start, then I did six flips. It was less than the chances of three to three, but once one has flipped one, the, the odds of each individual flip are 50-50. See, you could get, I could get six of the same. The odds of that happening before I flip any of them is fairly small, but probability is a lot of fun. It's kind of counterintuitive in many ways. Okay, <laughs> now I have shaped this arrowhead and it looks you know, the shape of the toothpick itself is pretty nice. I've got it quite thin. You can see, you can see its thinness there. Yeah, it's probability with Dyson Dungeons. I would say, though, that the probability of something happening, like knocking something over and breaking it, is... starts to approach 100%. You know, if you say, during during this period of a week, will I be down, crawling around on the floor, trying to find the piece that um, I broke off? I should just put another camera down there, really. You know? The, uh, the crawling around on the floor looking for a, a little piece of plastic that got broken off of a model because I bumped it. It's another feature, okay, along with the oops button. This this would have deserved, I don't know, it came really close to being a major oops. It turned into just a minor oops because I did find the piece. Now, okay, now we start looking at odds again. What are the odds that I'm going to be able to cleanly take this off the toothpick? And then what are the odds that I'm going to not lose it on the way to attaching it to the... Uh, model and then you know we're knocking it over again this high tech painting surface you know that I cut out of a box I'm trying to keep costs out we need a we need some a, you know, about 7,000 people to sign up um, on patreon.com slash Dyson Dungeons. Okay. If any of you out there know 6,999 other people, um, get in touch with them and everybody go to patreon.com slash Dyson Dungeons and become a patron. And if you were to do that, I might be able to... Um, come up with a painting surface that isn't just this piece of cardboard from a box. Hi, new follower. You too? Really? That's amazing. Um, yeah. Uh, the, uh... Yeah, I, uh... I'll tell the story again because this is how things go on Dyson Dungeons is I I said well this should be on this holder because I'm going to be painting it and this helps hold it this is a nice handy thing with the camera up I mean and I'm not getting things on camera today that's a good sign too and so I set it down right and then reached over reached over the top of it and the sleeve on this oversized sweatshirt Thanks for the follow. Um, 
is uh Yeah, I knocked it over. So I and then I broke off the bottom. I, I this this part of the bow, I broke that off, and the arrowhead. I found that by crawling around on the floor, looking for it. I was able to find it. I can't couldn't believe it. It went flying. I mean, like three feet. Um, and then the arrowhead is missing, and so I've managed to, I hope, fabricate one off this toothpick. I'm just breaking it off at its weak point. No, come on, come off, clean. There, high tech breakage. There's, there it is. Such as it is. There's the arrowhead, which I'll set down there so you can all see it. And, um, I'm going to use this contact cement, which has worked really quite well for me for attaching tiny little things. <laughs> oh boy, this is going to fly again. I just know it. I'm putting it off to the side for just a moment while I, un while I open this. This stuff comes out like very viscous. It adheres to itself really well. It doesn't always adhere to the surface that I'm attempting to cement to. Let's see how this goes. I try to do this without tweezers. No, I can't do it without tweezers. Oh, welcome to the club. I didn't do miniatures in 1972, but I did participate in D&D &D starting in about 1975. So we are of the same demographic or close to it. The, um, yeah, I was in Madison school in Madison in graduate school and cable TV came out and I participated as a camera person on a telecast as a telecast of uh, a Dungeons and Dragons campaign we did that on the community cable TV well the community cable TV station every Saturday night I think it was yep it was a lot of fun that was it's quite an, a thing to do back then I think we probably had like no viewers I'm pretty sure that that was the case I mean like who this is this is a time when people were going out, you know, going out and seeing movies and hanging out with friends and things like that. But uh, some of us, some of us who didn't do that, <laughs> played Dungeons and Dragons and uh, put it up on the cable TV community station. Okay. No, it's not perfect. Okay, I'll say that. Uh, but it looks like an arrowhead, right? So way back in 72, okay, who manufactured those? Or did you make them yourself somehow? Historical miniatures. Wow. Yeah, first edition D&D. I have to brag a little bit. We don't have, like, the one that came in sort of the plastic bag, the really, really early one. But we do have a mint condition um, box set 
with like the crayon dice in it. And it's in mint condition because we never really, we never hosted one. I was never a DM. Um, okay. You do? Oh my. It's, yeah, sometimes you really just, you have to hang on to things, right? Just have to hang on to them. But it's really, it's good to meet somebody who's uh, in the demographic. The, the downside of hanging on to things, as we're discovering, is um, I won't say that we're hoarders. I won't say that. Because we're not really. If we were hoarders, we wouldn't be able to walk through the house except for a short, a, a narrow passageway. But um, there are certain rooms that are filled with, um, got, we got real modern uh, plastic bins full of stuff. Okay, so I'm still, I'm just rotating this and showing it off because it, it doesn't look too bad. There, there's a blob there. Um, right here where the contact cement blobbed up, but there's not much I can do about it. That contact cement is not going to really cure or harden probably till Friday. Oh, slowing. Yes. What do we do with it as we slow down? Well, one thing I know we don't do is we don't lift big boxes of heavy stuff and put them up into the crawl space anymore. Um, we, we get, uh, children and children-in-law. Exactly that. Exactly. We are going to just leave it to, to our family to deal with later. Um, I, I can tell you for certain, this is definitely not a lie. I know I'm not making up a fiction here, but my wife and I have said that several times is, well, at some point it's not going to be our problem. <laughs> You know, and sometimes we say, well, this might be something the kids are going to want. Because when I was growing up, my mom just, my mother threw away everything. So we had all these classic games and toys like girder and panel builder sets and, you know, well, and, and they were always in good condition too, because we didn't break things when we were kids. And then they all just disappeared. She just tossed all this stuff. You know, when she could have been, they didn't have these nice plastic bins then, but they, she could have filled all sorts of cardboard boxes with them and stacked them up, you know, in, in the corner of the basement or something. But no, she kept a neat house instead. And, uh, yeah, so sometimes, sometimes then as adults, we do foolish things like we go on eBay and find the very same erector set that we had when we were a kid that disappeared after we went off to college and yep and now and now it's stuck in a in a corner of um on a shelf at least it's on a shelf down down in the basement storage area all right um well this this now has the pieces attached and it looks more or less No, we won't ever admit that we don't have the originals, right? It looks more or less like it did before I knocked it over and shattered it. Um, I'm really kind of glad that I didn't break it yet even more. Um, I can't paint this stuff up here until maybe at least the, the stream on Friday, maybe even a week from now. But if I'm really careful... No, I mean... Yeah, if we were, if I were to admit buying things that we had as kids, that would there there would be a number of them, not a lot, you know. Although, you know, one one purchase, this is kind of I don't know if anybody else even knows about this. There's, there's this game called Little Naughty, N O D D Y, Little Naughty Taxi Game. And my brother and I used to love that when we were really tiny. I mean, we were like four years old or something, right? 
Um, this was done on the rosin printer. Uh, Alexis, our, who also serves as our DM our, for our uh, Dungeons and Dragons stream. I'll plug that later. We Dungeon Dice and Dungeons is all about Dungeons and Dragons, and we do a, a show. We have a show that's been going on now for about a hundred episodes. Uh, this was done on the rosin printer across the hall, and we have oh lots of them. I'm going to take a chance and show some of them. Yeah, it's a really pretty one, isn't it? You might like this one. This I finished this one a couple weeks ago. This little fairy. This also was done on the rosin printer. Uh, this is also fragile. I, I managed to break one wing. I didn't break the stick. That was kind of a surprise. I tried a couple of times, but I only broke a wing. So that was kind of, this is kind of cute. Some of them are, you know, we do all sorts of them. Um, kind of moving in a different direction is uh, a demon toad. This is a very large, gigantic demon toad. Okay. Yeah, it one came out pretty well. That's cool. And then for some reason, I think it's because it's going to show up in our stream. Uh, this is a, a fungus monster. I just, I just finished this last week. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does look like one, doesn't it? Just the colors. This is sticks. This is sticks. It's done. Who? Um, spent viewing points to name it. This is this is it. Uh, yeah. So I finished that. This wasn't really. You know, in terms of colors, it wasn't that challenging, but getting all of these little stripey things, the red on the, you know, and whatever, and the glowy green eyes. Yeah, I think it is supposed to be like a swamp thing. It's supposed to be like, that's why I painted like the mycelium down here. It's supposed to be rising up out of the ooze and it's probably not going to be friendly. You know, it's very likely not to be. Let's see, and the other one, this one is the only other one that's not painted yet. This is a Shetland pony uh, unicorn with a big long mane. So the, the rosin printing things, yeah, uh, it, it, they come out really well, but they're, the, but they're really fragile. The, the plastic is uh, brittle, I'll just say, which makes it quite easy for me to break them, giving me plenty of opportunity to uh, experiment with different adhesives. And uh, the pony will start probably next week. I'm going to be working on this today. I'll see how far along I get. And then um, I'll be doing, you know, some base coating on this. And then uh, submarine Wednesday. Okay, on Wednesday I'm working on a 1960s vintage Renval cutaway submarine model. I'm actually working on three of them because I bought three to get parts for one, because they really are vintage model kits. That's another li reliving a childhood thing. I built that back like at seventh grade, so a long time ago when it like first came out in the 60s. Um, yeah. I don't know anything about rosin printing either. Uh, I know that there are different kinds of, of rosins. Um, I don't know if there are any that are less, that are more like more malleable. What I do know is that this, it's very strong. I mean, it actually is quite strong, but it's um, brittle. Okay. Um, Odds are really high I'm going to knock this thing over again. So I'm going to keep putting it off screen when I'm not holding it. Excuse me while I do that. I've been told that I know who would really like to see that thing painted purple and pink. But I was told that it should be painted autumn colors. And I'm going to avoid yellow. 
because yellow just um, doesn't cover very well. What I am going to do though, this is this is something I'm going to go do, is I'm going to use this pearlescent neon purple paint on the wings because I think that's going to look pretty cool. I've on the wings on the other little fairy I use the pearlescent white, which gives it kind of a nice glowy kind of thing. Yeah, I'm a medicinal shy guy, um, but that that got vetoed by the artist <clears throat> um, in our family. Uh, it's going to be painted autumn colors. I think this cork brown is a good brown color to go with autumn colors. And maybe this bone white. It's a cork brown. I have this here. Bone white's kind of a nice... No, bone white is not a good autumn color. Um... I'm going to try to find the... Well, I really should use this clear orange. That's a really nice bright orange. It doesn't cover all that well either, but let's see. Um, so reds. This amaranth red, which is kind of orangey. People are saying good things about purple and pink. Good for them. Um, this bronze flesh tone. I think I've actually got this out. No, everyone except that. So I get this. I really like this part of the, the stream. This part of the stream is um, just painting, just not painting, you know. This beastie brown, I might use that. Yeah. Thing over here. This is, I should show this to you later too. It's a custom-made paint holder put together by our DM. There it is, the bronze flesh tone. That's this one. Amaranth. Let's see if I can find amaranth. Or this, like I was saying, I really like this part because I don't have to paint during it. I can just, you know, talk about painting, but not really do it. <clears> oh, <throat> this dark vermilion. That's a good color. But I get to, like, not, not do any painting. Um, just talk about doing painting. I find it. There it is, because it's already out. So I'm. Yeah, the paint phase. I am going to start painting uh, relatively soon. Yeah, I mean, it's, I'm only into it for 45 minutes so far and haven't painted yet. Um, I'm going to be using this really, really white, white on the wings. That, that's straightforward. Let's see, I've got, um, she's got like an overcoat. I don't want to use too many colors here. Or maybe three. Okay, so there's like boots, and usually I paint the boots sort of a darker color. I don't know, it just seems to work better. They're kind of weighted down. The boots might be... Do those in kind of a brownish color. You might do those in the uh, bronze, the, this kind of bronzy color. Okay, and then using dark vermilion and amaranth red on the clothes. So I think I'm going to use the amaranth on the, like, the pants and undershirt 
and then the dark vermilion on the over part. You know, this is this is one of my least favorite things. Okay, is uh, see that tiny gap there between the back of the cloak and the front of the wing is usually I it it just it's really hard to get that painted right. So I the the problem here especially is that the white doesn't cover that well. So if I get red on the wings and then paint them white, you know, because it looks like here I'd want the the skirt to be painted first. Okay, and then the wing is getting the paint underneath there without getting it onto the wing and then painting the wing. I'm not too terribly worried about getting the white paint on the red because the red will cover over pretty well, but the white won't cover the red. And then the down underneath there, the inside of this skirt like thing, okay, shows there. And I I could paint that yet another color. I could paint that um, kind of a brown color, maybe, as opposed to the colors of the over. And then there's there's other little things like she's got some bracers. It looks like I'm going to paint those the, probably the same color as the boots. And at some point, let's see her hair. Oh, her hair should be like autumn. Should be really yellowish with a little wash on it. We'll see how that goes. And then there's a belt. There's some little details that just need to be done. Um, yeah, for this, I'm going to have to put my head magnifiers on because my vision, both near and far, is not so good. Um, and there's detail on this that's really kind of hard to see. Not so much down here. Okay, where the base, where the pants and the boots and things are, but up around her neck, <clears throat> it gets a little more complicated. I think, I think I'm going to start with this overskirt thing. Um, Yeah. Isn't that how it goes? It takes it takes like the better part of a day to set some of these games up. You know, and then uh, there's no time to play them. There were some my cousins and I used to play um oh these I can't remember the names anymore like Panzer Blitz or something. They were all done with little <laughs> uh, hexagonal tiles. And, you know, there are like 150 of these things in a box. You had to sort through them all to find the ones that went along with that scenario. <clears throat> Hi. Welcome. Welcome to Dyson Dungeons. Um, yeah. And, you know, then we'd set up and... it fill the whole table but when we needed the table for like eating like you said and well okay everything's just a mess today so anyway i'm going to slip these on they're really uh i think they make me look better actually but it's the same sort of thing you spend all your time just setting up Okay, what this looks like is that there is kind of like, like a unitard sort of thing. The pants, pants and a shirt, and then the overskirt. It actually looks like her arms are bare, except for some piece of armor, but it's probably an undershirt. Um, 
and then the belt will be a contrasting color. Feathers on her hair. Yeah, is this other than getting into places like behind between the wings there and the lines here, it's not gonna be horrible to paint. Um, but we'll see how it really turns out. Okay, um, I'm actually going to start painting, for better or worse. Oh yeah, you did that too? Avalon Hill, those are the god ones, all the Avalon Hill games, which were just beastly things to set up. And, re I mean, and a turn took forever because there are so many pieces on the board. Some of the scenarios, you know, you had to worry about the terrain. Um, I don't think we got into weather conditions. We didn't get that deep into it, but the terrain was always an issue. Constant arguments about whether, you know, there was a line of sight or not from somebody's howitzer, you know, or whether the tank, you know, whether the tank could fire on your troops, whether you were sufficiently hidden behind a hill. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I think we ended up spending, I don't know that we ever got much more than like four turns into the game, to be honest, <laughs> before something, either we ran out of time and had to clear the table, or the dispute uh, turned the... Uh, the battle simulation into a real battle. It was almost like that. So that was, those are really a, a really good, really way, way to waste time on a, an entire Saturday when it was raining outside. Exactly that just constant argument about whether you're in cover or not or is there a line of sight and then and then you couldn't remember the rule exactly I mean so you finally agreed right okay in this particular case there is a line of sight but you are undercover we finally agree on that and then you have to look up the whole rule book again about distance type of cover you know and what what difference it made in terms of the effect of the attack. Yeah, the hyper-realism of those games, in a sense, you know, the simulated realism just made them almost impossible to play, but they were always great fun. So... Let's see... Let us see if this paint covers well. If I remember it, it's okay. Some of these, sometimes the oranges, reds, and yellows, and whites, they just they don't cover as well as the greens and browns. Then I'm going to use this little bitty brush. Um, to get the edges. I'm painting, I'm painting the top part first. belt will get painted later. This is it. This is the painting part. You get to see the top of my head as I bend over trying to get paint on the parts where I want the paint and not on the parts where I don't. It looks like it comes around under her arm like this. And it kind of comes up around like, like this here. So I'm trying to 
don't want to get the orange on the way. Do want the orange to come down. I'm actually going to go over the lines a little bit on this side because there's a raised edge there. And I want the orange to cover that raised edge. I'll paint up to it later with the other color that I'm going to use. My hand is not being steady today. Sometimes with these models, oh yeah, the um, the this is actually a great primer on here. Is it? <gasps> no. Huh. Okay, I never primed this one. No wonder the paint's not going on right. Anyway, there's a primer that's almost exactly the same color. Um, so much so that I couldn't tell that this one wasn't primed. I, well, we'll just have to be careful to um, not rub it too much with our fingers and rub the paint off. I have to confess, we've gotten, you know, we're trying to do, keep to a, a budget that we don't have. Okay. And so, we've been using, um, for primer, we've just been using off the shelf stuff. And it seems to be working pretty well on most of these models. It worked. It it works okay on the rosin, the stuff we use from the rosin printer. It works. It works really well on the uh, polystyrene of the old model kits, like the Submarina building. For some reason it, it just works. It does really well on that. Um. I think it's, you know, it's just from a hardware store and a spray can. We have to use it in the garage, though, because, yeah, we have an airbrush, which I am really not good at. I mean, I have to say that. And when I, I mean not good, I mean terrible. I'm terrible at airbrushing. I don't know why. Not looking up at the moment. Okay, so there's paint on there. So, you know, you're getting some painting with Dyson Dungeons today. It's actually happening. Um, which is really unfortunate because a lot of a lot of models, you know, airplane models and things like that, cars most models actually um, to be painted need to be air done with an airbrush and I, I don't know maybe maybe if I practiced a lot I could probably do that but we use acrylic paints with the airbrush because they're not terribly poisonous compared to uh, compared to most aerosol paints But um, I haven't needed the airbrush on the submarine model because all the stuff I've been doing so far has been tiny, tiny detail. It's a cutaway model. Yeah, who you come here and do this and break things and then try to repair them and 
try to explain why you broke things in the first place. This is kind of kind of a nice autumn color, I guess. Nicole wanted this one painted autumn colors, like reds and stuff. You know, so reds and oranges, and this is this is orange, kind of reddish orange. It's kind of pretty. And what I'm mostly trying to do here, I mean, it looks like mostly what I'm trying to do is paint it. But what I'm mostly trying to do is not drop it and break it again. What I'm failing at doing, this this is, see, there's a little oops there. Right on the tip of that, I can't clean that off because that's still not cured. Is um, the most common minor oops. Knocking this over and breaking it was, was really, I think, qualified as a major oops today. Most of the minor oopses are very, very carefully painting, but not very carefully bringing the paint up the brush to the surface to be painted. So, yeah, so I'll get a lot of it there. Well, especially the reminiscence things. I've, I've been spending, just ask anybody, I spend a lot of time talking about you know, like 1960s cartoons and stuff, TV. When I'm working on the submarine, I reminisce about uh, what it was like growing up in the 60s and going to state fairs. You know, you go to the state fair and uh, spending some time with the fallout shelter salesperson. Usually a salesman, I have to say that. Let's just be honest. Mm hmm you know and they all they had mock-ups yeah wasn't that cool they had mock-ups of the of the um, of the fallout shelters so you could go in and lay down on the cot you know the whole family went into this little room and they tell you how they could you had two choices you could uh, they'd bury it in your yard they'd come and that's what they said anyway dig this big hole in your yard and bury it and you could either access it through your basement if you if you put it close to that and put a door in the basement or you could have like a secure hatch that just went down to it I'm not going to talk much about that now because that's it's more appropriate to talk about it when building a model of uh, a missile launching submarine from the 60s. If it's ever appropriate, but that was always fun. I don't miss about that. I did a stream where I talked mainly about Tom Terrific. You remember Tom Terrific? <gasps> oh yeah, the Airstream. <clears throat> mm -hmm. It was like Mom, Dad, can't we sell our house and get an Airstream? They're so cool. I don't know. Parents never really, uh... Never took that seriously. We never... We never got close to getting an Airstream. Or a fallout shelter. For that matter. Kind of cool. So maybe I'll talk about fallout shelters again on Wednesday when I do submarines. I can do a repeat, right? I'm old. I can repeat things. I can just pretend I hadn't talked about it before. And unless somebody in chat reminds me, oh, I heard this all before and I don't want to hear it again. So unless somebody does that, and who would be so rude as to do that? I might do a revisit. Of growing up with the bomb in the 1960s. And the fallout shelter salespeople. So, did you have a. Yeah, we didn't wear onions on our belts. So.
So what I was thinking of rambling about today, before I had a major OO and broke this and got off on talking about Avalon Hill games and playing original Dungeons and Dragons on cable TV in 1975. Oh, that was kind of fun because we had two cameras. These cameras, you know, were the size of, they're, let's just say they were gigantic. Um, is you couldn't roll, you couldn't really do a D20 roll, right? Because they were, all these cameras were big and heavy and they were just on these stands and you, all you could do is rotate them. There, there were two axes of rotation. You could tilt them up and down, and you could um, rotate them. Um, but if I recall, there wasn't any way to change the focus. Sure, I mean they were, they were the kinds of things that they that were put in the. Uh, cable access, community cable access studio. So we were lucky that there were even two cameras, but um, so we couldn't do a, a close-up of a dice roll. So what we did instead is one of, one of the producers of the show, I, I can call them a producer because they actually produced this thing. It was, it was the only prop in the show, okay? This is the prop. They produced this. It was um, like a wheel of fortune. Okay. Somehow or other, they were able to get a big piece of plywood. Okay. The budget for this show was so low. I mean, so non-existent that um, coming up with a piece of plywood for this wheel of fortune thing, probably, you know, the producer who wanted to do the show, we said, if you want this, you're going to have to figure out. And it managed to get a big piece of plywood, cut it into a circle about, I don't know, two feet in diameter. That's really what they would do. Wow, so you lived that close. So you got you got to watch like B-52s fly overhead. That's amazing. My uncle was in, my uncle and father were both in the Air Force my, during World War II. Um, my dad didn't stay in, but my uncle became a lifer. He, he didn't work for SAC, he worked for MATS, which is the, uh, is basically the uh, UPS of, of the military, which served uh, all the branches, actually, military air transport service. So he did all the, worked on the bases where they were, where they moved stuff around, you know, the cargo planes. But, um, you know, I grew up really loving, loving, uh, you know, that kind of thing. In fact, after I retired, I decided that I was going to build models like I did with a kid, with a kid. And most of the models that I've got stacked up here in the basement because I never got around to doing any of them for some reason or reasons was, um, Oh, okay, that wasn't supposed to be painted that color. Sorry. Right right through here, there's an opening in, like there is on this side. Okay. There's an opening on this side that um, needs to be painted the under color. So this, this is turning out to be kind of a nice, I think that's a nice autumn color, don't you think? Pretty nice autumn color. I think I'm going to paint her armor bits. She's got some like pauldrons and elbow things. I'm going to paint those copper just to stay, you know, in the tone. 
and I thought about painting the boots brown? I'm not sure. I'm thinking now that they might look good in like a deep red and not really have any brown on, on this model at all. Just oranges and reds. Yeah. We weren't quite so lucky growing up. There was uh, there was sort of a military base near us um, that they did refueling tankers. And actually, that didn't come to kind of later. But what was speaking of B-52s, my brother and I would go camping on this island in northern Wisconsin. This was, I mean, there's nothing on this island other than moss and trees and stuff. It was primitive, real primitive camping. Um, but, yeah, um, oh, we've, I've got a really nice bronze, really nice bronze color. It's darker than, than the brasses. It's not quite so shiny. I think that would look good. I like using that. Thanks for that. But there was a time when there was a sack base in northern Michigan, and the B-52s, you know, instead of flying at 40,000 feet like they were designed to do, they decided that it, it would be great fun for them to fly under the radar. And so they'd fly these things at like 500 feet, and they would fly over the lake. That was, that was pretty scary and impressive. It's pretty cool. But I, I always loved B-52s growing up. You know, that was like, yeah. That was, it didn't happen very often. But when it did, you knew it. Yeah, they were flying under the radar, so they were really, really low. And I'm not sure why they flew over that lake. It must have been, you know, they always tried to pick terrain that was similar to the place where they were going, the targeted area. So I'm, I'm guessing the terrain there was uh, similar to something like in mid-eastern uh, Soviet Union. So yeah, we, we did that and, and the, they, um, I think that's when they were launching cruise missiles. So they wanted to get as close to the target as they could to get within range of the cruise missile. And then they'd pop up and launch it and then drop back down again and hopefully get away. Before they had cruise missiles, you know, the, the thing that they would do was, and they probably, they might still do this, um, is they'd fly in at really low altitude and you could think if they were dropping a bomb. Well, yeah, so there were fighters too. Now the F-4s, those were... Yeah, you knew it when those took off, didn't you? Get their afterburner as they took off. No, I'm really envious growing up that close to a base. I mean, most people would say, yeah, you know, all the noise all the time and smell of jet fuel and the disruption and whatever, but... Yeah, didn't you just love the F-4 when they first came out? I remember my dad was, you know, because he, he had been in the Air Force and my uncle still was when they came out, that... Uh, They'd laugh and laugh. It looks like a garage door hit it, because it did. You know, the wings were bent, the tail was bent, the nose was bent, everything was bent. But they were the most amazing planes. It was one of those things, you know, like the F-35 is supposed to be now. Where the F-35 is the way it's supposed to be now, where it's a multi-role sort of plane, an interceptor and a ground support and all that sort of thing the F-4 really was. It was one of the very few planes that was adopted by like all of the services. 
they all flew F4s. It was just that versatile and amazing. And I really kind of liked the way it was, uh, let's just say, asymmetric. The angles on it. It was way before stealth. It wasn't the reason for it, but it was an amazing plane, so you got to see those. My new follower, thank you. Since I'm looking up on... Okay, I have to, to um, just explain that... Um, since I'm wearing these head magnifiers that make everything twice as big as they really are so I can actually see what I'm doing you know I have a large the f-16 yes the f-16 is pretty cool too I have to say but this is almost heretical but it's true having gone to air shows fairly frequently Sorry, I just saw a spot that needed to be painted in the other color that isn't, so I need to go back to that just real briefly and paint this a little bit. That the F-18 that the Navy flies is um, a more impressive plane in flight than the F-16. But the F-16 is, is really good. Did you see F-15s? Did you ever have those? The F-15 for a while was my favorite plane of, of among the modern planes because it was... that was a beastly plane. I mean, just... hugely overpowered. There was this air show once I went to the the F-15s had come in, you know, and they did the static display where they just sat around and the pilot said, oh, look, this is a really cool plane. fighter pilots you know they're they're babies really you know for some reason or other they let like 22 year old people fly these things maybe that maybe that you have to be that young I guess I don't know to have reflexes enough I remember having reflexes but those days are gone anyway yeah so the, yeah, they really, they weren't stationed there, but so these two F-15s were at the air show and uh, the air show ended and the planes started leaving and we had, for some reason, stayed there until the planes were leaving. I don't know why we were still there, but it was pretty cool. So these things don't need much runway, it turns out. So they lit up their afterburners after what looked like an incredibly short roll, popped up maybe about, it was less than 10 feet up off the runway. This all happened in less, in, in like fractions of a second. So they make this short takeoff roll, pop up off the runway, retract the landing gear. Okay. And, on these fighter jets, retracting the landing gear isn't like an airliner where they grind, you know, and slowly rise up or the way you see it on bombers. They just popped into the fuselage. So these things popped up off the runway, retracted the landing gear, pop, just like that. They're down, now they're up. And as soon as the landing gear were stowed, pointed straight up, and did a vertical climb, just like up to probably 3,000 feet or more. It was 
Okay, you didn't really need to do it that way. That's probably not the most fuel efficient takeoff, but it was really impressive. Just bang. Those were oh, oh, way overpowered planes. The F-4 was almost like that, except it was a very heavy plane. As well it needed to be. Let's see. Yeah, there's this shirt between the bracers and the cloak here. Yeah, it's almost hard to believe that these planes are actually even better than the F-4s and they retired the F-4s. I'm not sure why. This is like one of those planes that should fly forever. Like some planes do. Do another air show story. The, um, there was, uh, what is it, a KC-135 or something? I can't I remember. I feel bad not remembering the number. It was the, the uh, refueling plane based on the Boeing 7. So that's parked there, and they got the Air Force guys there who are all you know, like 12 years old, or so it looks like to uh, to us more mature people. Elbow guard here. Bracer and in her hand, so the shirt just goes that far. And next to it was parked a uh, Lockheed Constellation. You know, the one with the three tails? Um, absolutely gorgeous airliner. There are stories about that plane, too, that are kind of fun. Anyway, yeah, so it's parked right next to it. And it was undergoing restoration. It was just barely in flying condition. None of the interior was done. The paint was didn't look very good, so it was being restored. The guy, the Air Force guy goes, really? Our plane? Our plane was in service for years before this thing was even built. Seriously, the, uh, the refueling plane had been in service. It had been built and been in service for several years before the Connie was ever even built, and the Connie was undergoing restoration. Oh, this other plane was still in service. Well, the B-52s, too, they're still in service, and those things were all built, some of them built in the 50s. Those are planes that are still in active military service that are as old as we are. Right? The engines have been changed. You know, they put new, new bigger turbofans and stuff on them. I don't know how much they probably have rebuilt the entire airframe more than once in that span of time. But it's pretty amazing to think about that. So, do you have other bombers there too? Did you, um,. Did they ever fly in like a B-58 at the base that you were near? Does anybody listening have any idea what we're talking about? Back in the 50s and 60s, you know, flying higher and faster was the way that 
you know, the designers all believed would um, allow, allow the, the bomber to get where it was going. Maybe not necessarily get back, but at least get where it was going. And um, so the B-58 was built to be a supersonic bomber. It was actually designed initially to fly at a low altitude, but above the speed of sound. And so it'd be actually, you know, if you're flying at 500 feet at 1100 miles an hour, odds are that you'd not only be hard to detect, but the anti-aircraft weapons that they had couldn't, I mean, just wouldn't, wouldn't work. They don't, they're not designed to work at such a low altitude. They were designed to work at high altitudes. Anyway, it probably would have worked. The major problem with the B-58 though, yeah, exactly that. It's exactly that. Uh-huh. Exactly. <laughs> like the push broom. All original. None. None of it is still original. Hmm. Yep. That was... I mean, the, that was a, that was the idea. Mm hmm but mainly at the low altitude and uh, yeah I mean they would have been not necessarily undetectable because if they flew over something it would definitely be noticed since it was really quite loud uh, but anti-aircraft missiles could not target it so you know people were what they would have to like shoot at it with rifles practically I mean seriously even shoulder-launched, these little Sam shoulder-launched things wouldn't work very well because it would just be here and there so fast. But its range was terrible, you know, because in order to fly at that speed, it was a fairly small bomber that had to carry its payload externally in a pod. Um, but the four engines it had four turbojets back then uh, we needed that much to get it going they had to be on full afterburner to go supersonic so this thing would have to be refueled just before it entered uh, its attack mode and then barely had enough to come back out again hi hola brogger yeah I mean, it was it was a very very narrow fuselage. I think it had a crew of maybe two or three, com compared to others. It was almost it was not terribly much bigger than some of the, the fighters at at the time. In fact, I think if you were to compare it to like an F twenty two now, it was probably smaller. But it packed a lot of engines. But it was pretty amazing. So, old Brogger, I. I I am glad to see that you're alive because last we talked on Friday, you were headed out on icy roads uh, to take your daughter to skating. And uh, I hope that, well, obviously made it there and back. Oh yeah, that, but um, thank you. But I want to say, first of all, I am glad glad to see you because I was actually concerned as you were heading out Denmark where old Brager is uh, had a huge blizzard I mean even by Midwest US standards a uh, huge blizzard and he had to go out and drive the day after so I'm glad you're safe and I want to thank you for the shout out on your New Year's Eve stream that was really nice of you to do that Really appreciated it. It was not so bad when you first went out. Did it get bad? So how do you, what do you think? Are these good autumn colors? 
Well, thanks so much. Uh, Olaf Rager runs a really nice stream. He is um, a very skilled model maker and has amazing model making tools like laser cutters and this, the tiniest little bandsaw. Uh, just, yeah, really cool stuff. You should watch, uh, watch his stream on YouTube. It's really, it's just some really cool stuff. Like the the one day build of the uh, the, win the winter scene, but thank you. You came in in a discussion with another old person who likes airplanes. So we were talking about, uh, well, he had the privilege of living near a sack base and saw B-52s and B-58s and F-4s and all sorts of really cool stuff. And I grew up in an Air Force family, so I'd it's some, you know, I know a little bit about it and really liked airplanes growing up. Built, I built dozens of models when I was a kid. And I shouldn't say I really built models, with, well, I glued them together, okay? Um, I didn't discover paints until later. So the, I have to say like the first 10 models I built were pretty much just um, spider webs of tester tube cement and decals. It's a spot I was trying to touch up. No, I can't find it. But I built, yeah, I had lots of those. Oh, Legos, neat. I built them with my erector set. I got an erector set one Christmas. That was pretty exciting. It was the one that came, I don't know if people are familiar with the old ones. It came with a blue motor. which was kind of fun. So I could put a propeller, make a propeller, put a, you know, I was thinking back at it, not the really brightest thing to do because there was this little piece of sharp edged metal spinning around on the front end of this motor. But I did build a lot of plastic models. That's how I coped with it. being an adolescent was hiding in the basement building, which I guess was you know, a safer thing to do than, than some people would do in their absence. Anyway, yeah, but I didn't discover paint until much, much later and never really got good at it. So that when you're watching, well, yeah, you are. Do you step on them? That's always, that's a, it's not just a joke or a trope, it's the truth. Stepping on a Lego, is painful. Okay, so this isn't covering really evenly, but I kind of like the very the variability of the look of the paint. You know, uh, you can't really see it too well on camera, but there's that. So, yeah, my favorite plane. Sorry about that. Oh. Like the throttles? Did they do that on purpose? Or did the throttles get jammed? I didn't know that. Wow. Okay, so they were doing it on purpose like a test flight to see how fast it was going. Yeah, I mean, when you're going that fast, the... Okay, that's what they were... <laughs> I 
I hope they have permission to do that. Sometimes, you know, pilots will, uh, you know, it's like, hey, let's see how fast this thing can go. And everybody on the crew goes, oh, yeah, let's just do that. It sounds like a good time. Should we call into the base and ask for permission? And it's like, no, we'll just tell them that, uh, you know, there was a throttle malfunction or something if they ask. Am I saying that right? That's what, what that's the way it would work. Um, but yeah, the paint peeled off. I read about that, the XB-70, you know, the Mach 3 bomber, um, the one that looks like a snake, Cobra snake. Uh, they had that, they, they had that problem when they first flew it, is that the paint would, the paint would all peel off. Uh, they, they didn't have it, but uh, boy, a, I did not know that a B-58 could do that. It was hugely overpowered. I mean, if they put those four engines on an afterburner and they just let it go, that's pretty amazing. I think they had that problem with the X-15 too. I'm not sure how they figured that out. They, uh, there's some sort of black paint that managed to withstand like Mach 6 or 7 at the time. That's a great story, though. <laughs> okay, I could, but that's just the kind of thing that would happen back in the in the 1960s. I mean, it just would. They'd take a plane up and they'd say, "Let's see how fast it could go," and we hope it doesn't break. And when I say break, I don't mean like the engine would conk out. I mean like break apart, because that could happen. Oh, there's a whole section here I didn't paint. I don't have to squeeze out some new paint. Yeah, because it wasn't a Boeing plane and everything else was. That makes sense, too. Poor Boeing. Boeing has lost its way. So, uh, old Brogger, do you have... Do you have scars on your feet from the Legos? Did you ever have them draw blood? I did once, that was not good. I'm just asking, cause, you know, see if we share an experience. Yeah, there's a side skirt here. The B-58, yeah. Um, the, uh, the B-70 did too because the ejecting at supersonic speeds would kill you and I mean, just boom like that isn't the B-58 isn't it a beautiful plane though the B-58 I mean with the, the delta wing those four gigantic engines um it basically, that's all it was, was a wing with engines. I mean, there's, it, the fuselage was minimal, just what, you know, I mean, just what it needed to carry some fuel. And then the weapons pod slung down below it because, uh, you know, it was built for super exciting flight. Um, well, there was that. Being, excuse me, I have a mug of coffee here. I have to show this off. This is the official Dice and Dungeons coffee mug. Okay. Which I was told we would actually sell someday, but we never have. Yeah, isn't it cool? A nice logo. Um, printed. Hi. 
Hmm. Okay, stepping on is one part, but wow, getting your foot, that's, that's beastly. That's really, wow. <laughs> Thumb as well. You know, um, practically the only thing that bleeds worse than a head wound is like a finger cut. I can just go on and on. I could tell a story about how when I cut off a tiny tip of my finger once, it ended up, I ended up having to go to the emergency room. It was this tiny, you know, just this little thing about an eighth of an inch in diameter. But uh, they ended up putting silver iodide on it, which it, w it hurt a lot. Um, I'll just say that. The... Um, that's the only way to stop it from bleeding. So, how long did you have your thumb immobilized for you? I think... I think that Legos... Probably next to knives and scissors are the most dangerous thing you can have in a house. Military development was really different in the 50s and 60s. Um, planes in testing just crashed all the time. Mm -hmm. And the children survived after that. I'm sure that, uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, with a wound like that, you end up with a gigantic bandage. You can hardly use your hand. Wow. That's a really good Lego story, though. That's that's a classic significant injury. Would you like to repeat the words you used um, as your thumb was impaled by that Lego? Okay, this darker red paint is going on the boots, but also the belt. Okay, so I'm going to have to somehow get a little stripe of paint across the waist here. I, I just discovered there's a whole, like a big piece of plastic that is not painted, in, onto which I need to apply paint of a different color. Going to be incommunicado here for a minute as I focus on trying to get this belt painted and then and then take a quick This is this is kind of touch up thing that happens to me is when I, I rotate the model in ways I hadn't rotated it before. And then see spots that are missed, like this very large one back here on the back of the skirt. And if I don't attend to it right away,
Oh no, a train. Oh, wow. All sorts of sharp edges. Yep, everyone in your family knew there was a problem, right? <laughs> that, uh... I have to say I'm lucky, and I think probably because the Lego was embedded in a carpet that um, I never had it when I stepped on them. They didn't draw blood, but wow, that's a bad one. And it's on, you know, you, you don't expect them to be on your hand. Oh, Ole, you do your your pod, your uh, stream in English. Um, did the words you used with your Lego incident? Did you do those in Danish? Just curious. I don't know why I'm curious. Probably shouldn't ask, but I am anyway. This red, this red isn't differentiating itself from the vermilion. Um, it's not. I want to paint this, this one boot. I might have to do this whole thing over because you can't tell the difference between one color and the other, and that that misses the point here. So now. When, I, when it dries, it might be different. And I'm going to paint the, the whole boot, because if I stop now, then it'll leave weird marks and stuff. Hi. Uh, okay. Oh, <laughs> it was a bilingual, a bilingual reaction. <laughs> Mm hmm sometimes there's just no substitute for that word <sighs> you know I know every every language every language has to have the equivalent but sometimes um, you know it is what it is and it has to be there It is? I didn't know that. I guess I never bothered, you know, to look at the etymology of uh, the word. So to use it appropriately, do you need to use like a, a fake French accent? That, that, would, that would seem to be right. On the color chart, this darker, this flat red looks much darker than the vermilion. Mm -hmm. Or in this case, the French F word. Yeah, yeah, let's lose let's use all of the antique. I mean that really dates us. I mean you start using those uh racial epithets, right? No, that's not the same. It just doesn't hmm. This is kind of dumb. I'm going to paint the other boot, too. I mean, I've got the paint out. I don't want to waste it. Oh, jeez. How did I... How did I miss that? 
I missed the whole side of the skirt on this side too with the vermilion color. Okay. I was so busy reminding myself and saying, oh good, I remembered to get it done on the other side that I totally missed, missed this. So I'm gonna paint this boot, this dark red, and after it dries, after break, because I'll be taking a break fairly soon. Um, we'll see if, if the color is good or not. And if not, then I'm going to just repaint it with a darker red. Zombie deer virus? Yeah. That's what I've heard. I hope, I hope it doesn't strike the deer who live in our yard. I mean, they don't live there, but they visit frequently. I think, I think some of them, some of them even have names now. Buddy. Buddy was one. Buddy was born a couple of years ago and is now getting his first antlers. He's got a little spike, I think a two point. You know, the, so Buddy's growing up. Deer frequently come through here. And um, yeah, Buddy's one of them. Yeah, it looks like it gets, I think it's darker as it uh, dries, but it might not be dark enough. I'm not sure. So anyway, I painted the other boot, but I need to uh, paint the big part of it that I didn't paint. The vermilion color. I need to squeeze out more of that. I think it's pretty likely that I'm going to have to uh, grab a darker red for the belt and the boots, though. But look, and that whole side right here is completely missed it. Kind of hard to, it, I don't know how. Of course, I put a blip, you know, like I said, the major. The most frequent minor oops is getting the brush to and from the work surface. Yeah, right there. And I immediately put a little spot of the wrong color, the over skirt. Mm -hmm. So if you haven't noticed by now, I am not a master modeler or a professional painter. I'm an old guy recruited by Dyson Dungeons to paint their minis and their dungeon tiles um, because I'm retired and they're not. So I've been told, well, you've got lots of time and you like doing this kind of thing. I'm not sure either of those is actually true, but you know, there it is. Okay, well, I got the paint on there. And really need to do is uh, cover up that little blot. <laughs> well, that's not, no, it's not the same meaning at all. And it's a good thing you can type that in because I said that word earlier. I'm trying to keep this like a PG-13 thing, but I guess, you know, when I said Retiring is, a, you know, some people have trouble retiring. I don't know about you, uh, but uh, assuming you're retired, the uh, I'm, I really am good at retiring, at being retired. I am really, really good at being retired. I was able to adapt to retirement. Someone said, well, how long did it take you to, uh, you know, adapt to being retired after working? And I said, how long did it take to walk out the door on the last day? It was that, it was that easy. So it's not that, uh, 
that I hated my job or anything. It's just that not working is just so much nicer. That way I can spend, um, you know, four and a half hours, three days a week doing relaxing painting on behalf of Dyson Dungeons. Okay, so this is coming along. Um, the contrast between the over coat and the undercoat in the pants is pretty good. These boots might not be dark enough. I'll see when I come back after break, but it just, even as they're drying now, it just, you can't, can't see the difference. Okay, between those. So I'm going to paint them very likely. I'm going to be using the scarlet red, which is one of our most used colors. You, you ended up using... Isn't that the truth? You end up retiring, and then it's like... Oh, you know, just all the time just disappeared. Just all gone. I was planning to do... That's why I bought like three dozen models. I thought I'd be bored silly and I'd have to spend like five hours a day building models and I ended up not building any of them until I started building them on this stream. Um, so that's when you built a big boat. I saw the big boat on your, you showed it on your, uh, That's right, there's a new king in in there. I wonder, you know, what kind of, uh, you know, pension queens and kings get. I bet it's pretty decent. I bet you, I bet you even get like, well... Mm-hmm. It does, it does. And when I retired too, it was like, I feel busier than ever. How did I ever get anything done? So those of you who have retired, you know, you, know, you may or may not have had that experience, but uh, if you're going to retire, there's, it's really quite possible that you'll be busier than ever and you'll say, how did I ever do anything like wash the dishes even? So that's when you managed to get the big boat done. That big boat is pretty amazing. I was going to do something before break. What was it? And it wasn't painting the boots because those will have to be done later. I'm going to check. The scarlet red is pretty good, but I've also got this really dark black red. I'm not sure I want to get that dark, though. But the scarlet red, definitely, I need to. The, the, the contrast in color, you can start to see it, okay, between between the boots and the pants but it's not it's not what I what I wanted things I have to decide what color to paint her hair and these these wings on the top you put these head magnifiers on well that's a good time for a break then well um, I'm glad you're safe and thanks again for the shout out on your stream and um, I'm going to be back well I'm not taking a break quite yet because I want to see one more thing before I take a break and uh, as Katie and I hope you hang on because it's great fun talking about uh, airplanes we get to talk that, about those very often so she's got long flowing hair in the back here it kind of comes all the way down in the back. And then there's these wings up here that... I guess I'm going to just paint those the same white with the pearlescent as I use on the wings. I think I'll do that. And then her hair... I'm going to find a color for her hair. I don't want to make it just yellow. Okay. I want to make it a little bit different. So I'm going to look at my uh, color chart. I'm 
I'm going to call the... Sorry, I'm flipping through the color chart, which you can't see. That's not fair. I think I'm going to paint it um, this color. The hair is going to be this color. Okay. And I'm going to try the scarlet red on the boots. Hopefully that will work. When I know I'm going to knock it over, I'm not careful. So I'm going to take about a half hour break. I always say I'll back it about 30 minutes and then it's like 37 minutes. Just always happens. Need bronze for the armor. White for the wings. Flesh tone. I wonder what, what did I use on this one? This color worked out well. I don't remember which one, what it was. Hmm. Yeah, I should keep a color chart. I mean, a list of things so I know what what color I'm painting. That's kind of a good color. I'm just muttering to myself as I'm poking through paints, trying not to knock things over in the process. So far, I haven't knocked anything over. Mutter, mutter. Anyway, the color I'm looking for is no doubt out here somewhere. There it is. I didn't recognize it quite. All right. Um, if I don't take the break now, I'm just going to be... Thank you. I'm going to be back at about 12.30. Um, Dyson Dungeons Relaxing Painting is Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays from 10 until 2, so I'm going to especially invite you back for Wednesday, for Submarine Wednesday, because I think you might enjoy seeing the uh, the ballistic launching submarine prototype model, the 1960s vintage model, which is a cutaway of the George Washington, which was the prototype Polaris launching submarine. So um, if you can't rejoin after the break in about a half an hour, please come back on Wednesday at about 10, for Submarine Wednesday. Um, I'm getting close to being done, which means that uh, there's something to see. You can actually see the inside of uh, the submarine. So I am going to break now because, you know, need to take a break. <laughs> I'll be back in about a half an hour. Oh no. Okay, well, Catch it on YouTube then, okay? Okay, well, this is something almost unprecedented. Um, I'm back from break on time. Yeah, usually I'm somewhere between four and eight minutes late. You know, to be precise, right? Uh, but <clears throat> I know. What can I say? Just, it's really disorienting. Here I am. I just, what to do? What to do? Uh, but, yeah, I'm working on this. And as the paint dries, I'm just looking at the boots. It's just, the, the they are darker than the pants, but just really not noticeably so the belt I'm, gonna, I'm not going to mess with the belt because that's just it's hard to paint um, but I'm going to paint the boots darker yep I'm going to do that and then uh, what should I do next I can do the the like the uh, arm armor you know the elbows and the and the bracers The, uh, yeah, the, I'm going to have to wait until Friday to do the bow. 
even if I move, even if I get this moved along really well, I'm gonna have to wait till then because the the cement isn't quite setting yet, the contact cement. Um, I think what I need to paint next though is the wings, because that's those are gonna be painted bright white, and then that needs to dry before I put the pearlescent overwash on them. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. Oh, yeah, here's another part. The the inside of the, the cloak. Well, let me do the wings and then I'll do some of the other stuff. I'm going to paint that. I'm going to just paint that brown just as a contrast. So the wings, including the wings on the head, repaint the boots, paint the inside of the overskirt, kind of a brown color. Um, and then just getting down to these old detail things that take forever, like the, uh, the face and the hair and stuff. Anyway, yeah, that. So I'm gonna use a little larger brush for the wings, because there's fairly large surfaces on there, and I don't, you know, this little brush will take forever to get that done. This this brush, this brush gave rise to the story of the women during World War II who got radiation poisoning by trying to keep the tips of their brushes coherent. And it did that because this has got bristles sticking out all over the place rather than being coherent. But I'm just using water to try to put them together rather than licking it. And like they did, and they licked it, unfortunately, while they were using radium-based paint so that it glowed in the dark for them, for the... the instrument dials that they were painting. Okay, this there's a bristle here that is just... Yeah, that needs to be cut off. It's bent and it will not... it will not come back together. Okay, well, I'll use this brush, see how it goes. Get this paint to stir. I haven't knocked it over yet. I had a new follower who lived near a SAC Air Force base growing up and happened to be in my age demographic, so it's there when they were flying B-52s and B-58s and F-4s, all sorts of really amazing planes. And so a little bit jealous, but we got to talk about um, the music playing, yes. We got to talk about World War, post-war, you know, 1950s and 60s uh, airplanes, jets. Air Force planes and things, and that was that was a lot of fun. So those of you who who might, you know, if you're listening to this and not watching it on YouTube, you wouldn't see the other side of the conversation. So if you're checking this out on YouTube, make sure you watch the chat screen. I'm assuming that shows up on YouTube because it shows up on my screen here. So to know what we were talking about, and Ola Brager came on, but he's having dinner now, which is nice. And we were really happy to see Ole because um, last Friday he was going out the day after a huge blizzard, but came back safely, so very happy about that. Hey. There. I have to check the weather here, because there might be bad weather coming. 
it is winter, you know, bad weather happens in the winter. And, um, you know, I just have to sort of plan around it. Not, I don't think I've got anything outside the house that I have to be at other than like picking up the mail and that sort of thing. So one of the nice things about being retired things about being retired is um, not having to it's not just getting up at like six in the morning but it's driving in the snow at like 6 15 in the morning right not having to do that is a really nice thing I'm gonna have to get the little brush out um, get to the the boundary area there probably should have done that first but I didn't so I'm going to paint the wings as much as I can using this larger brush which has bristles sticking out all over the place and I put my head magnifier back on and um, paint, paint the uh, boundary between the white and the other colors Oh, that bristle has got to go. It's like sticking out at a right angle. And even though it's just one bristle, it'll just leave this big white stripe things. Yeah. So, here. Not a white stripe like the band, which would, you know, is a different sort of thing altogether, but... painted stripe the tweezers are all full of white paint so these are just getting base coated white 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 and it doesn't have to be um, you know totally even a little variation is good I managed to get some right there right nice big white blot right there on the skirt where I was trying to be careful and then wasn't nice nicely done so that all needs to be covered over it was one of those oh yeah the most common error the most common oops is a brush to or from the work surface and there it was Going up to the work surface and managing to get a big blot of white paint on the whatever color that was. I'll have to find it. And there's some more there. Oh, these rogue bristles there. And that's what I mean about white stripes. Look, all over everything. <sighs> okay, so I'm going to be spending. There's There are more bristles that are just breaking off of this brush. Going absolutely everywhere. That weren't a problem before, but are now. That managed, okay. So yeah, I'll be paint, pulling both of those base coat colors out in just a few minutes. And um, yeah, this is going really well. Well, there are now fewer bristles on this brush than there were before. Mess that made. So yeah, I'll be doing a bunch of touch-ups that I was not anticipating having to do or wanting to do, but now need to do because that brush was a failure. Long sigh of sinus. Using this little brush, which gives me some sense of control. Paint the boundary color between the white base coat on the wing and the, uh, the rest of the model.
This one is less critical because I haven't painted the hair color yet. But boy, I made a mess. I made a mess on the parts that I base coated earlier. Here is getting the paint underneath the other color. Getting it on the other color, but well, getting, it has to be touched up anyway. It would be unfortunate if that were the only problem, but it's not. So this is relaxing, making a mess with paints with Dyson Dungeons. He was doing pretty well before the break. You know, maybe I should have stayed on break. Post-break here, it's not going up. I mean, not all of this can be fixed. It's just like, but why? Why do I have to repaint all of this? And then she's got these wings on the top of her head. These feathers. I don't know why, but they're there. And I have decided that they will be painted the same color as the big wings. Being feathery wings. There I am painting those. And I have like 10 times more white paint out than I need. So the thing about painting these details with the head magnifiers is that bent over, racing my little sh somewhat shaky hand today that's holding the model. This is a nice combination. It's like maybe the vibrations of my hands will cancel each other out. You think that'll happen? Anyway, I had a wonderful conversation about 1960s eras. 60s and 70s eras aircraft, which was, which was really cool to do. Maybe some of you were interested in that. If you are, this that would be a good episode. Got to talk about B-52s and B-47s, 57s, 58s, duh. B-52s and B-58s and F-4s. A little bit about the B-70, not very much, just in passing. Having to do with paint peeling issues at high when, when, when flight surfaces heat up because of, you know, air friction at high speeds. Okay, I'm going to wait for this white paint to dry a little bit, and then I've got a lot of touching up of both of these colors that I used previously. All around the model because of either shaky hand or rogue bristles or just typical bringing the paint up to the work surface oops so while I'm waiting for the white to dry enough to do the touch-up on top of it with the other colors the amaranth and vermilion while waiting for that I'm going to get to the darker red red out and repaint the boots so that they look a little darker than the than they do now of 
cleaning off the tweezers. I use these to uh, pull off the rogue bristles on the other brush and got paint all over them. Um, and I should clean this other brush too. Leave stuff on camera. You now there's still some bristles that are not adhering here. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I'm doing a lot of sighing here because stuff. this other brush upstairs that has this is an older brush but it has kind of a nice point on it I'm going to try this on the boots because it's a little more bristle than the really teeny brush so it might work better I mean faster at least and if the point stays coherent this will be a really nice brush to use um, for, for other painting stuff things being coming incoherent. It is a, it's a 10 0, 10 0 brush, which is really nice detailed brush size. So these boots, you know, they're painted already, but the the red is not very different from the red of the pants. So it doesn't contrast. I mean it doesn't show any different. So I got this darker red out. You know, repainting the boots in this darker red color. And I can tell out almost, yeah, just what I just did is I uh, had the brush right there as I rotated the model and almost jammed the brush into already painted spots, which would have probably on the white, you know, where it would take seven coats to cover it. That would have uh, put a big red blot there. So you can see that there's just a lot of touching up that needs to be done because just because of not being careful or trying to be careful and failing. I'm finding that I'm wearing these head magnifiers more and more because it just makes, well, there's two things. One is it makes things, it magnifies them so I can see them better, which is good. Otherwise, everything's kind of fuzzy and distant. So it makes them look bigger, but also clearer. And there's a supplemental LED light on the top. And that really, and finding that that's really helpful. The extra light that goes right to where I am painting. You're going to be seeing me wear these things and leaning over as I'm painting. Probably just more and more often. So earlier, what we were talking about, strategic air command bombers, you know, and that sort of thing, it sort of led to a little bit of discussion about, you know, what it was like growing up in the 60s and going to state fairs and seeing the fallout shelter salespeople and stuff like that. But that's a conversation that's more appropriate to Submarine Wednesday when I work on um, a Renwall cutaway model of the George Washington, the first Polaris submarine launch ballistic missile submarine. So I'll save that for then. Now this color is working much better. You can see the, you can see the contrast between the two colors there. 
it's much improved. I need a dot here though. This is where the, the belt is on the back of the model. And this isn't the color I used for the belt, but since you don't see the front and the back at the same time, right? You can put this on the back and you won't know that it's not the same color as the front. Okay, so I'm going to use this. I'm going to use the tiny, the teeny brush for the touching up. It's, it just, I think, works better. There's more of this amaranth than there is the vermilion that needs touching up. So I'll just get this. Now I'm going to do the the I'm going to do the dark red first, the vermilion. Uh, because it's in some places where I might get it onto the amaranth and then I have to touch up the amaranth. That happened before when I was doing it the first time. So this is the color that goes on the... Um, To the underside of the unitard tunic kind of thing. And there aren't very many spots. There's some right there. See what I mean about that getting onto the area that needs the lighter color. That might be all there is. Seems worthwhile squeezing that out and getting it on the brush, but there it is. Okay. But, uh, and then the other one is the, uh, amaranth, which is a more orange colored one. And there's a lot of this touch up cause I got white paint all over, just like scattered over everything. this touch up decide what to do next especially here this is where the rogue bristles really made a mess bristles that came out at 90 degree angle to the rest of the brush Yeah, but there's just some little touching up around the boundary color here between the wings and the tunic. And like a little spot there. Okay, and then a little bit here too, where the from one direction it looked like it should be one thing, and then from the other it looked the other spots on the back this big dot here I cannot say there was any excuse about rogue bristles that was just I brought the brush up to the work surface and smashed it unintentionally but just smashed it into the uh, other color so since I have this color out now, I'm going to rotate this model around to see if there are any other places that need touching up. I'm sure there are, but just try to find the obvious ones. Yeah, not too bad. It's a little bit. Just an uneven line there with a purpose was it had like a little dip in it. Those are the kinds of things that on the submarine drive me crazy. The 
back and forth with little dots of paint. But, yeah. Not being a particularly good painter, not being a master modeler, not claiming at all that I know what I'm doing, because in reality that's not the case. Yeah, it's trying to get it to the point where I can say that'll do. Without doing, as I sometimes do, getting to the point where I can say that'll do. And then I do one more little thing and it uh, just messes it up. And then it won't do anymore. It's a doo-doo. space under the wing that's got white on it. So these white wings, it's a good base coat, but it's, I'm going to put um, a pearlescent paint on it later to make it look shiny. But that white paint dries slowly, so that's going to be a ways off. Okay. Amaranth off of the brush. And the part that I have now forgotten about like four times that I just saw again that reminded me that it's there is the um, is the back of the cloak, the inside of this the kind of orangish thing. Um, that's the inside, the back of it, which I could do the same color as the front, but I'm thinking... I was thinking, you know, it's the inside of a piece of clothing, and usually the linings are like a different color than the outside. So it's kind of an orangish. Orangish brown color. This that I'm going to use. And we'll see. If it looks okay, that's great. If it doesn't, I can paint over it, I guess. Okay, I am now suddenly realizing as my blood sugar is going down that when I took a break, I should have eaten something. Yep. So, you know, if I start babbling incoherently or, you know, just suddenly slowing down or something, it's because, um, because of that. But I think I, I can last another hour without uh, too much danger. So I'm hoping that this looks okay as, oh my God. <sighs> oh, did you? Yeah. I was trying to squeeze out a little drop, right? Just a little drop of this paint. And it wasn't coming out because there was like a little plug or something. So now I've got enough here to paint the entire surface of about 10 of these. Day, what a day. Okay. Anyway, this color is going on back here. And I'm going to do my best to get it on there without getting it on. Yeah, see, the to and from, as I pulled the brush away from the work surface, I very nearly, very nearly smashed it into the leg of which would have not been good I'm going to do this very slowly and hopefully deliberately and carefully so as to avoid that kind of oh oh this looks like seriously this brush has now developed rogue, rogue bristles that are sticking out the side of it. I guess they came back on. Oh, 
when this dries, I hope it looks, you know, we're trying to give it kind of an autumn color look here. Brownish reds. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that this dries a little darker than it is going on right now. There I go. I got it on the boot. Nice, nice little spot on the boot there that I need to fix. That'll show. Almost. I almost got it done. It was right near the end. Right near the end, the last little bit. And there it went down to the boot. Okay. Um, guess I'm going to paint the hair next before I paint the, the skin tone. Try that anyway. What color? I was going to paint the hair. He's going to paint the hair the paint color that I just painted on the back of this. Yep, did the wrong color in the wrong place. That was going to be the hair color. And I was going to paint that darker. So, good for me. But looking at that, it's... It changes color pretty dramatically when it dries. So that's going to dry later. And yeah, I've got all this paint out. Like I said, I can always repaint it if it doesn't turn out. But I think this, I don't. Do just a bright yellow hair, okay. Even with a with a brown wash on it, sometimes it it might look okay. But I'm thinking this will look a little better. And I'm gonna put a little bit of brown wash on it just to try to get it. I mean, almost invisibly, just to get the the hair strands right. Ear is there. And these nice pointy elven ears here. It's taking a while because it, um, some of these spots are a little hard to get to. It's kind of flowing around. Comes up next to the wings. color but I, this is supposed to be fall this figure is supposed to like represent fall so I'm thinking you know the darker orangey kind of color is more appropriate than a bright yellow that's this that's my story and I guess I will stick with it Thing 
into here. And it, starting to get any yellowy. Trying to get it, you know, these feathery wings on the, her head here are not hair colored. Just trying to get the line between them, the demarcation line, even and more or less in a sort of natural looking spot. having trouble focusing in right there. has achieved a level of yeah it's a, it's okay um, I got some of the hair color on the ear but I haven't painted that yet so that's not a at this point not a big problem not until I paint the, the face and the ears and then I get the face color on the hair and I have to come back and touch that up I think that hair color is going to look okay. I think that's actually going to be okay. Especially with a tiny bit, just a tiny bit of um, brown wash on it. Okay, before I touch up the boot, where I managed to get some of this yellowish paint on it, okay, before I touch that up, the... Um, Paint the back, the inside of the cloak, the correct color, which was going to be this one, but now I'm not sure. I want to keep it a little yellow. I'm going to try that color, uh, this color here. And hopefully that will look okay. Ah, okay. I understand. But uh, thanks uh, for joining in. I really appreciate it. And hopefully you'll come back for Sub Read Wednesday where you'll see me 
uh, making some progress. It's really kind of coming along, uh, getting much closer to finishing it than I was a couple of weeks ago. At least you can see that it's a submarine. So thanks for joining in after break. I hope your dinner was good and we'll see you Wednesday. This color is better. Squeezing out went better anyway. I didn't get too much of it that time. Yeah, once this will be better. Orange color. And the kind of orange color is fine for the hair, but didn't look good back here. So, wasting this paint is like even that little dot, it's like ten times more paint there that's just gonna dry and be essentially essentially wasted. Then actually is going you know, I mean we're just we're talking about pennies, but still. Okay, now I have to do some touching up on the boot. This is always, this is why some of these end up taking so long is that it's just like back and forth, back and forth, touch up, touch up. If I were a more skilled painter with steadier hands and better eyesight, so I'll blame some of the physical things. Steadier hands, better eyesight, that would work. But also knowing what I was doing, being more skilled would help color was it this one okay and there's still some left there I wonder if that'll be enough I wonder if this would still be usable yeah it's skinned over I don't think I don't think that paint's gonna work let's try it see if see if it works it's just not I was able to squeeze out a tiny bit that time. Unfortunately, fortunately, I can get to this touch-up spot from the back. I was looking at it from the front, and it was like, how will I ever do that? Well, couldn't. Couldn't get there from here. There's another spot here. I saw another little spot. It. I'm sure I'll see it later, right? After that paint's dried and I'm ready to just move on. I'm starting to whine and moan. It's, I'm getting to the complaining part of this stream. I'm getting to the, why didn't I eat something? My blood sugar is low. Uh, the paint's not going where I want it. Ah. That's so typical of relaxing painting with Dyson Dungeons is at some point it just becomes that. So. What I was going to say, though, before all of these interruptions that occurred because of the painting, you know, all this painting stuff getting in the way, is it was like, what am I going to talk about during the stream? And, you know, fortunately, someone came on that talked about old airplanes during the 1960s and stuff, and that was really cool. But what I was really going to talk about I just saw some white spots that needed to be you 
is is like you know i have to talk about something that's kind of irrelevant but old so i was going to talk about mr ed you know and everyone knows the theme song right a horse is a horse of course of course of course course was used like because it rhymes with horse not too many things do but course does so horses highly repeated I mean, just over and over again during the theme song because why not it rhymes and kind of made sense you know a horse is a horse that rhymed of course of course talk to a horse of course it is of course once again the horse once again is the famous mr ed finally we get to not horsing and coursing took a while and then we learned about people because people yakety yak away and waste your time of day but mr ed will never talk unless he has something to say okay now that line never made sense really because no one talks unless they have something to say they say the thing that they say right if they if they talk they're saying something so obviously they had something to say and that's what they're saying when they're talking so mr ed will never talk unless he has something to say just means that he doesn't talk until he talks so that part you know well it's just lyrics with theme song and who thinks about that so they got away with that. It's not as dumb as some some of the lyrics to some of the Christmas songs that we've been listening to, but I won't get into those yet. Maybe. Anyway. But then you go right to the source and ask the horse a new rhyme source right not course they'll give you the answer that you'll endorse yet another rhyme that isn't course so the second verse i guess i'll call it um after people yakety yakking and never talking unless he has something to say the second verse was it's not too bad because uh, there's two new rhymes there so that was good and ask the horse, he'll give you the answer that you'll endorse. Pretty cool. You never heard of a talking horse? Hmm. Well, listen to this. And then Mr. Ed goes, you know, Oh, yeah, Mr. Ed. And is Mr. Ed kind of vibrato kind of thing. So... You know, growing up back then, what else is on TV? Hardly anything. So, of course, we watched Mr. Ed. I'll admit to that. Nothing to be proud of, but a lot of people did. Because it stayed on for, I don't know, like many seasons. So the main character, other than the horse, was Mr. Ed, played by an actual horse. It was a real horse, of course. Yes. Wilbur. You had to do that. Yeah. That's how I know the name of the uh, the main character is Wilbur. Wilbur something. Because that's, you know, Mr. Ed said that a lot. They probably recorded it like twice. You know, and every time they needed Wilbur. In the episode, they would just play the recording. I'm sure that happened. We wanted to keep Wilbur consistent. Um, is I think this was a really low cost production. I'm saying that because if I recall, and I, you know, probably recall something, how can you not? But what I remember about it is that, you know, Wilbur was the, 
the owner of Mr. Ed, that raises some issues, we can get into that. But, um, you know, Mr. Ed lived in a barn and Wilbur worked in the barn. He had an office there. I think it was right in the barn. I don't know why he didn't have his office in the house. I'm sure there was some sort of dynamic thing going on there. Um, we don't need to worry about at the moment. Anyway, uh, he had a big drafting table, so he was, I think, yeah, he was an architect, I guess, because he was, had this big drafting table. They didn't have CAD CAM back there. You know, they didn't have, they didn't have CAD, so he had to do his drawings by hand. So that was on the same set. So it was like his barn and his office, and I think there was like a fence, a white picket fence or something. And that was just about it. If I, you know, from what I recall, very rarely had anything other than the barn and the office. So they were not spending a huge amount of money on sets that I recall for this show. Maybe it just, maybe keep, maybe the horse was really expensive. And I think the cast, remember there being much of a cast, there was Wilbur, you know, there had to be Wilbur because otherwise it wouldn't make any sense for uh, Mr. Ed to be saying, Wilbur. But there was uh, the guy who lived next door. And there was, the relationship I remember was very, it was a fraught relationship because Oh, I think the running gag was that Mr. Ed would say something, you know, that was kind of offensive to this neighbor guy, but would say it out of sight so that he didn't see the horse talking. And then would blame Wilbur for saying these things and they, you know, get into this like, it wasn't really a fight, but it was, you know, an antagonism. that was caused by the horse, but the horse, you know, and how do you explain to your neighbor that I didn't say that, my horse did, right? That's not gonna work. And I think pretty much, I think pretty much that was every episode of, um, of Mr. Ed. Is, you know, we'd see the barn, and sometimes, but not always, we would see the office, you know, where, where the drafting table was, where Wilbur worked. And then the neighbor would get involved somehow. For some reason, there was always some reason, I don't know why, but there would be some reason, and Wilbur, then Mr. Ed would say something, and what was his name, Roger? I think his name was Roger, he had a little mustache. Um, would be offended and then it had that little we can't I can't tell Roger what really happened because you know talking horse not not uh, not something you want to get into that was it that was Mr. Ed so if you have the opportunity, I know it sounds really enticing now. I'm sure you can, I don't know, maybe on Netflix or something. I'm sure somewhere you can find old episodes of uh, Mr. Ed. And you can check it out. And if you watch a couple of them, you know, f find out find out for me if, um, if there is anything other than... Uh, you know, the barn in the office, whether the production crew spent money on anything else at all in terms of sets and what those might have been, uh, but also if anything ever, I'm sure there were other cast members, but they were probably all just incidental to uh, Wilbur and Roger being upset about something that Mr. Ed said. And Mr. Ed had to say that because he never talks unless he has something to say. 
So his 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 freedom to choose to be silent probably couldn't happen. I think this bronze color is pretty good for the armor bit. Well, brass would have been way too bright for the color scheme that we're going for here, this sort of fall look. But the bronze, you know, it's metallic, it's shiny, but it's not not really real bright. And we didn't want any brightness here. Um, okay, I should probably try to do the belt buckle. These are always... Belt buckles usually usually end up being the impression of a belt buckle. You know that the paint goes on to the raised area of the buckle and hopefully not terribly much elsewhere. You know, just enough so you can see that there's like a buckle. Really? Just the very last episode? I hope it's not tragic. It would be sad if the last episode was tragic. Oh, maybe. Maybe in the very last episode, Roger, Mr. Ed talks in front of Roger. That would be kind of cool, is to have that happen. You know, where you go like 7,000 seasons or whatever, of the major, the major plot line being Roger being insulted by Mr. Ed, but not, but Wilbur having to, you know, take the brunt of the blame because couldn't say his horse was talking. To the chat room, why did that pop up? No, oh, that's just the thing on the bottom. Never mind. <laughs> it only shows up on one of the monitors. Okay. Um,. Well, I'm not going to play around with that much more. I need to paint the base coat on the face and the hands. Can't avoid that forever. So I'll have to watch the last episode. I, you know, There's always that. What do you do when you're ending a show and you know the show is ending? And sometimes everybody just gets on screen and waves goodbye and that sort of thing. Sometimes, you know, just it's just like any other episode and you don't know it's ending. There must have been something on Mr. Ed, though. Um, I wish I remembered what color I used. The skin tone on this one. No. That wouldn't happen. There's there's no way they would kill off Mr. Ed and boil him down. You're just saying that to make everybody feel upset. I really can't remember the color I used, but that's a good color for the for the skin tone for these things. I'm, I'm flipping through my um, color chart here, and I'm pretty sure it's not that. I guess I guess I'll just try this. I really I hate touching this one. It just feels so delicate and is, and I've only broken it like three times. Done with the U.S. What? The U.S. Treasury Department? Did Mr. Ed owe back taxes?
Mr. Ed had a, a side gig in cash and wasn't paying taxes or something? Really? Hmm. Or was it the U.S. Treasury Department raiding the set of Mr. Ed because the producers of Mr. Ed weren't paying taxes? Maybe the producers of Mr. Ed... Oh, maybe they weren't doing withholding on Mr. Ed's salary. You know, maybe like the hay and the oats and stuff were considered to be wages because Mr. Ed was working. And, and they needed... No, I'm going to stop. That's just getting... Why should I stop? That's just the kind of thing we do on Dyson Dungeons relaxing painting thing here. What time is it? Okay. I guess I'll paint the flesh tone here with something. To paint it something. Um, and then I need to do a promo for our dungeon tiles and stuff. Because I always like to show that off. Um, that off. That's wrong. Show off that. That was show that off. It's a split, a split something or other. I don't think it's a split infinitive. So I'm going to make a confession here that, you know, when we learned grammar in grammar school, I was actually pretty good at it, but I always thought that so much of it was just silly. Okay. So the, the thing I thought was silly was, okay, so you learn how to say things correctly. You know, this is how you should talk. You use, I did that, not me did that, right? Or give it to me, not give it to I. But then they said, well, there's one subjective and objective. And it was like, I mean, who cares? Who cares really what the names of these different parts of speech and their different usage and things like subjunctives and stuff. Who cares about that? Other than the people who make a living by giving them names, right? Or the people who make a living teaching people about the names that were given to them. Because it always seemed to say irrelevant. I mean, who cares about past participles and things like that as long as when you're speaking, you're speaking, you know, more or less correctly so that you're understood by the people around you and you're following the idioms and customs of the language that you're using. So what is it like linguists to spend huge amounts of time categorizing and labeling and naming things So, I have to say that I really did not care much for that kind of thing. And I was never really a fond of linguistics or saw the relevance of it. So anybody out there who's a linguist, you know, and wants, wants to get into a discussion about the value, I suppose we could do that. We haven't had any kind of esoteric controversy on this show. about something as consequential as whether or not the producers of the Mr. Ed show ever paid for a set other than the barn and the office that was in the barn and the, and the picket fence that was around it. It's always I like, you know, spending a lot of time talking about inconsequential things. So let's talk about parts of speech sometime. That would be, you know, that could be a thing to do here. 
or diagramming sentences. I don't know if they do that anymore. For some reason, you have to draw these horizontal lines and put different parts of the sentence on these horizontal lines. And then um, there were these diagonal lines that dangled down from the bottom of the horizontal lines. Where you'd put your modifiers, your adjectives and adverbs, you know, and you had to know the difference. Otherwise you'd get C minuses on your grammar test. You know, the differences between your adverbs and adjectives. Didn't have to explain it. I don't remember that you really need to understand anything about it. Just needed to know the names and needed to know when to regurgitate the correct name. But then again, you know, who cares? I don't know. I didn't care. I think I was okay at diagramming sentences. I think I almost always got A's or A minuses. But it was like, well, you do this in school. You have to diagram the sentence. It didn't uh, didn't make my speech any better. I didn't talk more correctly or use language better or even learn new words or anything. But I knew where to put that word on the horizontal or the dangly little diagonal line. So let me complain about that too. Somehow, I don't know. I just there are some parts of uh, some parts of linguistic education that just just didn't make sense. So oh, that arrowhead. There we go. That's early on in the show. I showed you that I used contact cement for that, and that one of the advantages of contact cement is that it maintains some flexibility. Well, you just saw there some flexing of it. Okay, if I get some of this paint onto the bow or arrow or the feather, the fletch, is that what it is? I don't know, the feather back there. It's also get painted later. If the, if the uh, contact cement sets by Friday, I'll be able to do that then. I guess this is the color I used on the other one. You know, it looks okay. I'm just bouncing around more than normal today. I'm not sure what's up with that. Probably what's up with that is that it's getting late in the stream and I didn't eat anything. So I'm going to go back up after the stream. Probably get some sort of lecture about, well, you know, you should eat. It's good for you. And say, yes, I know, but I got distracted doing something else. And I wanted to get back to the stream without, you know, on time for once. Which is true, I did. I got back on stream on time this time. Which is like, maybe once, or t might have been like the second time ever in the history of relaxing painting with Dyson Dungeons. That I got back on time. Break. Okay, um... This actually doesn't look too bad, even under the uh, two-time magnification of my head magnifier. I don't know if I'm going to try to paint face detail or not. Always do you try to like put blue eyes in or something? 
and make a mess of it and have to repaint over and over again. Or you just leave it the way it is. I don't know. I'll have to decide some other time. Because I'm, it's, it's, it's getting near the end of the stream here. So, let me... Um, let me recap what has been done and predict what will be happening next. And then I want to talk a little bit about Dyson Dungeons. Because that's what this is. <sighs> sigh, that's my sigh. Mm -hmm. That means an oots. Okay. I'm painting this fairy or sprite or something I'm not sure what in sort of fall colors so they're reddish orangish reddish colors okay um, it's coming along okay the uh, there was a disaster before the stream started where I had it on the stand I reached over to grab some paint knocked it over smashed this off this has been re-glued and smashed the arrow head off and I was able to find the part of the bow, which is really good because I could it would, I could reproduce it, but it'd take forever. And I made a new arrowhead out of a toothpick, which is something I've done off and on. Uh, and I bumped it a couple of times. I stuck it on a contact cement, which allows it to adhere immediately but um, it takes like a week or something to sell to to cure um, so that's not going to get painted until it's uh, secure enough um, got it base coated pretty well I don't think I'm gonna mess around with washes too much on the rest of it because the paint itself went on variably so it shows the texture okay um, I might I think I probably will try to do a little dry brush brown um, wash on the hair just to pick up the, you know, the texture of the hair strands. I may or may not attempt to put some blue eyes on this, I'm not sure. The wings, I am going to get some pearlescent paint. Pearlescent paint is very, very viscous, you know, it's like jelly almost. Um, and in the past, I've used the white pearlescent just to get some shininess to these kinds of wings. I think for this one, I'm going to use what's called the violet something or other. Purple, which has a little bit green and a little bit purple. You know, kind of various colors. I don't know. Boy, it really changes. I can't show it to you. It's way down here, and I already dropped stuff all over the floor. Is it... Um, I don't know. I'm going to test it. I'm going to have to test it before I use it, because it might end up looking awful. If it ends up looking awful, I'm just going to use the white pearlescent like I've done in the past. Um, and then... Yeah. I mean, that's what needs to be done on this. Paint the base paint the wings and the and the little feathers on the head uh, paint the arrow shaft and the feathers I could probably do those I might do the feathers in this dark red that I used on the boots and the belt I might you just use it there it's not very much of it just a little bit there and the arrow shaft and the uh, bow I might make the arrow shaft black just to contrast with everything else and the bow, I don't know, the bow I might make red. I might make the bow red and the arrow shaft just red-brown. But I think red would look good there. Maybe, you know, not using too many colors, but either the really dark black red, that, that would look good on the bow, and then brown, and then the arrowhead I'll probably paint the arrowhead bronze, but I can't do that now because I'll knock it off. Because uh, the contact cement hasn't set yet. So that's the kind of stuff I'm going to do on this. Um, what I might do now 
in anticipation of that is I'm going to get the white paint out, take this big brush, and I'm going to paint a blot, a blot of white paint on this so that I can test, I need to test the uh, violet, the, per, the pearlescent paint, the neon violet to see how it really looks on the white paint. I don't know how it's going to look. To um, put some on this cardboard. Okay. And uh, spread it around. And then I'll have a I'll have a test patch that I can use. Um way more paint than I needed. I'll have a big test patch here. And I wanted to have a little bit of texture, so I'm not gonna even it out. Because the wing the wing veins have a little texture. And then um, on Friday, when I do come back to this model, I'm going to test the the two pearlescent paints on it to see which ones look okay. And now I will talk about Dyson Dungeons. Dyson Dungeons is a family and friends group, and we put on a Dungeons and Dragons show, and that streams live on streams on Twitch with a live chat. <laughs> usually about three Sundays a month. Um, there are exceptions with holidays, you know, because that just messes up everybody's schedule, right? Uh, because people get off and they're not watching or they're busy and can't do the show. But if you can, you should either catch it with live chat on the Sunday when it sh streams on Twitch or you can always catch that in previous episodes on YouTube or even as a podcast. There are, you know, it's a show. So there aren't really any dead silent spots. And if there are, there's music playing in the background. But it's a, we're proud of it. It's a really good D&D &D show, I think. It's not your typical one. There's not a lot of combat. But there's a lot of, uh, it's really funny. Okay. It's really fun. Even during combat when we're mostly dead. Um, we try to keep it light and it's also like a PG-13 rated thing, okay? Our target demographics, we keep joking, it was under 7 and over 70 and it's kind of that way. So, you know, it's, it's good, even, you know, encourage your children to watch it. It's just fine for that. Um, so this, the relaxing painting with Dyson Dungeons, started because we do our own dungeon tiles, not just the minis like the one I'm working on now that I set aside so I wouldn't knock over. Um, these are done on a rosin printer across the hall that way. The dungeon tiles are done on these PLA printers behind me, and I'm going to show you some because they're really cool. Anyway, I'm setting this aside again so it doesn't guarantee I won't knock it over but it reduces the chances and I'm going to reach over in this other direction and pull out some dungeon tiles we produce these ourselves on the printers behind us they're a solid piece try to keep it on camera the walls and the floors these are <laughs> primed base coated and detailed but not yet washed we put a dark gray wash on these so that they look like worn stone and underneath these panels on the bottom are ball magnets and what the ball magnets do is they grip onto each other because they're balls they rotate so you can put these in any direction you want and they stick to each other this is just cardboard so you know you can tell that it's not magnetic sticking onto metal it's magnetic sticking onto themselves and we can just rearrange them any way we want. They're really, they work really well. When we do have combat on the stream, you can see these kinds of dungeon tiles in action. These are rough stone. We have cut stone, which looks, you can tell there's magnets in them because an alligator clip is adhering to it. This, this is cut stone, and it's like, the ones that we're seeing underneath me there. This one is washed, so you can see the, how it looks more realistic. Um, this one happens to have a sigil imprinted on it. That's part of the print, and that's hand-painted. 
Uh, this is like a fire mage kind of dungeon. Okay, the sigils are on the wall representing the fire. And you can see it's cut stone as opposed to the rough stone. Right? And we also have... We have sewer tiles, which I'm not showing you because I don't have any handy, but I have these. These represent our wood buildings, okay? And the wood buildings are, you know, they're primed, painted brown, uh, washed to bring out the wood grain, and then the stucco's hand-painted in front and back, and they work the same way. And this one, the others have these as well. I can show you have operating doors, which are really cool. So when you're going through the dungeon, or in this case a warehouse or a tavern or a mansion or something of that sort, and you want to open the door to go through to the other side after you unlock it because it's locked, and one of your party members successfully unlocks it so you don't have to use your crowbar, um, um, the, you know, your minifigures here, and you actually open the door and go through. So that adds a lot of realism to the to the dungeon. But the main feature, I mean, those operating features like opening doors and trap doors on the floor, things like that, sigils built in, um, is just the, the way the magnets work. Which gives you, you can buy some of these. There's corners and round corners and things. If you had a bunch of these, you can make many, many different configurations. And the neat part about it is they're done both on the inside, you know, and the outside. So now we have street tiles. There's a whole pile of them over there that were just recently finished. Um, and if you have street tiles, you could be inside, right? And open the door and go out onto the street and you'd have the finished wall there. So that's... That's why Relaxing Painting with Dyson Dungeons started, because as you can see, there's a lot of painting that goes into preparing these dungeon tiles for use on the show. And um, yeah. And then if there aren't any dungeon tiles, then there are minifigs. And if there aren't any minifigs, there's Submarine Wednesday, which is me painting old models. And the one I've been working on now for what feels like well over a year, and it probably has been, has been a Renwall submarine, a 1960s, real 1960s vintage kit of the George Washington Polaris la ballistic missile launching submarine. I am getting to the point where one can believe that it's possible. I'm going to put a lot of qualifiers on that, where one can begin to suspect that it might be possible to potentially finish this model during uh, the first quarter, that's what I'm aiming for, by the end of March of this year. I should, I need to say that, this year. Um, yeah, we'll see if that works. We'll see if I can get it done. It's getting closer and closer all the time to being finished. And the parts I've got left are not supposed to be very technically challenging, but they might but they have the possibility of being a disaster. Yay, so that's always worth, it's always worth coming in on Submarine Wednesday or any other day, as a matter of fact. Monday, Wednesday, Fridays, more or less 10 until more or less two. Because you never know what the oops will be. You never know what the oops will be on relaxing painting with Dyson Dungeons. Today you didn't see it because I knocked this over. I knocked this over and broke it before the stream started. But, the bottom of the bow in the arrowhead um, got busted as I reached over and knocked it off. I found the bottom of the bow. I had to reproduce the arrowhead with a piece of toothpick. And now I'm waiting for the contact cement to um, cure. And it takes, you can see there's a lot of flexibility there. It takes a long time for that to happen. And I really can't paint, as you can see, as I keep messing with it, right? I can't get it right. Um, yeah, it's just not going to be perfect. It takes, it takes a long time for that to become solid. 
even even now, even the wing which was attached with that she'll still shows some flexibility. But it needs to be solid enough for me to be able to get paint on it without knocking it off. And that's what I'm going to be waiting for. So I'll be back on Wednesday, sub-Wednesday, working on the Renwall Cutaway George Washington Ballistic La Missile Launching Submarine. And then on Friday, I'll be finishing up uh, this by uh, doing the bow and arrow and putting some sort of pearlescent paint, either the violet or the, just the white on the wings and painting the base. Yep, uh, paint the base and then um, probably start on the Shetland Pony Unicorn. Unless somebody else in the D&D &D family wants to do that one, I'll probably do that. Or unless something else gets printed between now and then. We'll find out. So thanks for watching. Um, if you can become a follower, I, we got a couple followers today and I want to thank those people who became new followers. If you go on YouTube, you can become a subscriber and please do that. That would be great. We'd like to hit, you know, more subscribers. And if you really want to help out Dice and Dungeons, go to patreon.com slash dice and dungeons, patreon.com slash dice and dungeons, and you can become a patron. And patrons get access to our DM notes and our improv warm-up sessions. And at certain levels can even be mentioned in the credits uh, on our D&D show. And as I said at the very beginning of this, if you have 4,999 friends and relatives, all get together, all 5,000 of you, and go to patreon.com slash dice and dungeons and become patrons. And then, then, um, then I'll be able to replace my cardboard painting surface with uh, something um, better, maybe. Thanks again. <laughs> anyway, I'll be back on Wednesday at more or less 10 o'clock. Uh, I'll aim for 10 unless something bad happens, like I knock something over again and bust it and have to crawl around on the floor finding pieces. Uh, but right about 10 until about 2 with a break in between working on the submarine. And then Friday, finishing up the little uh, archer sprite that I'm not going to show you because if I, I just don't want to touch it anymore just not going to take a chance to do that uh see you then thanks again and uh yeah thank you see you